All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon and welcome to the Database Administration Virtual Chapter for PASS. Today we're having uh, the lecture Part 2, Windows Clustering for the DBA with Ryan Adams. I'm Julie Bloomquist and I help out with the DBA Virtual Chapter. And Hewlett Packard Enterprise is our current sponsor. We once again want to thank our sponsor for uh, supporting our user group. PASS has a large number of virtual chapters. Go out to your PASS membership and associate it with uh, different you know, virtual chapters, any of them that you're interested in getting information on. Uh, you'll be receiving the emails about when the meetings are. All virtual chapters do record their presentations and usually post them on an archive page. SQL Saturdays are a one-day mini-conference. Here are some which are upcoming and they're held all around the world. It's a great opportunity to get a flavor of what a conference is and uh, get some uh, SQL education. It's minimal cost. It usually just uh, covers the lunch. PASS Summit is coming up. Uh, the pre-conference sessions are the 24th and 25th, and then the summit itself is the 26th to the 28th. Uh, the registration now is $21.95 until uh, midnight on the 18th of September. You can also save $150 off your registration if you use the, you know, our chapter code of VC15FPS6. For every 20 registrants using the code, we'll receive one complimentary summit registration, which we will raffle off in the fall. Uh, the PASS Summit is the premier SQL Server Education Summit. It, it's just amazing. If you've never been, it's a great opportunity uh, to get SQL education. There are Local chapters, once again, go out to your PASS membership. You can find physical chapters, or you can go ahead and uh, associate with a virtual chapter. And if there's no physical chapter in your area, consider starting one up. There's a lot of information and documentation, and the PASS organization will help get you started with a new uh, physical chapter. There are a lot of uh, volunteering opportunities with PASS. If you go out, you can look under my volunteering section on your PASS profile. And we're also always looking for uh, people to be nominated as outstanding volunteers, people who are involved in the SQL community, you know, local or with the PASS organization. Stay involved with PASS. Here's the information for the LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and the PASS website. Uh, once again, this presentation is being recorded and will be posted on our website, the DBA Virtual Chapter website under the archive page. So here's a little uh, information about Ryan. Uh, Ryan is a SQL Server MVP and he's worked for Verizon since 98. His primary focus is in the SQL Server engine, high availability, disaster recovery. Previously, he was a senior Active Directory architect and designed the company's worldwide Active Directory infrastructure. He serves on both the PASS Board of Directors as well as the Board of Directors for the North Texas SQL Server User Group, and he holds the following uh, certifications. And I'm just amazed he's able to also put together pre-conferences and lectures for the user groups. It's uh, greatly appreciated. Ryan, I'm going to pass the presentation over to you. Thank you, Julie. I appreciate that uh, very nice introduction there. Uh, can you see my screen all right? Yes, I can. Great. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining me today as we get into part two of Windows clustering. Uh, again, you can go in the archive section of the DBA virtual chapter if you want to go back and see part one. Uh, we'll be referencing a few things that we covered there as we kind of dig a little bit deeper into some of those things. 
So I'm not going to talk about myself anymore. Um, I think we've already kind of covered that. Uh, but uh, I do some consulting on the side through Lynchpin, so if you ever need any help with any of this kind of stuff, uh, feel free to drop me a line. I'd love to help you out with that kind of stuff. Uh, I, do have, I do blog on ryanjadams.com, so I do blog about some of this stuff. In fact, I'll reference a few blog posts that I wrote uh, as we talk through this part two today. Uh, you can also follow me on Twitter. I encourage you to do that. Um, my email address is down there as well. Um, kind of talked about this slide for the most part, going to skip all of this. Um, I will say that the past summit coming up this year, um, although I realize I still have my 2015 down there, I am speaking this year uh, at 2016 on MSDB. I will also be speaking at the IT Dev Connections in October. I'll be talking about uh, just an introduction to uh, uh, corruption uh, there at Dev Connections as well as policy-based management. So make sure you come stay high if you're at either one of those conferences this year. So here's our objectives just for today in part two. So we talked last time a lot about the different things that we need to have to create a cluster. Um, and we know that this Windows cluster piece is a requirement if we want to have a failover cluster instance of SQL on top of that or an availability group on top of that. So it's really imperative to the success of the instances that we built on top of this platform that we have a solid, properly architected platform. And if we plan for it up front properly and make sure that we have all of the pieces of information we need before we sit down and start the build of the cluster, we will be far more successful. I find that that is extremely true, that most people that have problems with clusters either because they didn't follow best practice, they didn't set up the architecture quite right, or they sat down to do it and they just didn't have prepare enough to have all the pieces of information that they needed. They get halfway through the build and realize, oh, I forgot to go request this DNS name or this particular IP address that I need. Um, now I've got to go put a request in the IP or DNS guys for that, which is going to push the whole project back because it takes them X amount of time to get that done. So if we plan, plan, plan up front and we architect it all up front and get all of our ducks in a row, it will go so much smoother and it will continue to run smoother over time if we architect it right. So I hope we've already set the stage for that in part one. We've kind of got most of our stuff prepared. But today we want to talk about quorum, which we just touched on last time that about how important it was. But there were some enhancements that got made between Windows 2008, Windows 2012, and Windows 2012 R2. And they weren't just small enhancements. These were really huge deals. So if you're sitting here thinking, well, I've already got licenses for Windows 2008, eh, why put 2012 on here? Or I've got 2012, why put 2012 R2 on here? If you look, once we get through the quorum section, I guarantee you'll want to put 2012 R2 on there. Um, at this point in time, we don't even suggest that people deploy it on Windows Server 2008. There's actually a host of fixes and KB articles and stuff that came out fixing different things. Uh, for running SQL Server on a Windows 2008 cluster, we highly suggest that it be done on 2012 and 2012 R2. If anything, Quorum will sell you on that by the time we get done with that discussion. We're going to talk a little bit about storage and what you need to have prepared as you think about the different types of storage because it depends on whether you're putting an FCI on top of this, whether you're putting an AG on top of this, and the different elements that you need to get that configured properly. And then we'll just talk about cluster validation. What is cluster validation? Why do I need it? What does it look for? What types of things do I need prepared that I can head off? Maybe that you know alarms and things that it might show up that are really common, that I can go ahead and fix those things now before I actually get the validation to make sure that the cluster validation will actually pass. So quorum is basically a voting mechanism. So um, we talked a minute ago about me being on the past board of directors and actually they're going to be opening up uh, for anybody that's interested in running for the board of directors, they'll be opening up uh, that if you want to submit yourself and throw your name in the hat. I always encourage you to do that. It's a really great experience. Um, you learn a lot of stuff in addition to be able to give them back to the community at the same time. And just like any election, to get elected, it's whoever wins the majority of the votes. And with a cluster, the majority of the votes is not just the winner, but that means that you get to stay up and running. So we want to have a majority of votes online at any given time. If we drop below that number, then our cluster goes down. 
So we have four different models of how that mechanism and that voting mechanism can work. Again, maximum number of votes out of a majority is required there. And if we look at the majority, so the very last bullet point actually shows the mathematics behind it. So you would take the number of total votes that you have, divide that by two, add one to that, and then we would round that down. I'll give you an example of that in a minute. We'll round that down to the closest integer. So if we had five votes, uh, which is an example we'll be using several times throughout the rest of the presentation here, we divide that by two, that gives us two and a half. We add one, which gives us three and a half, and then we would round that down to the close, next closest integer, which would be three. So out of five voting members, we'd actually need to have three of them up and running with their votes active. If we lose any more than that, the cluster goes down. So our first one here is node majority. A node majority says that every operating system gets a vote. And I say operating system for a reason, because when we set up a cluster, it could be physical servers, it could be virtual servers. But the differentiator there is an operating system that defines the server, whether it's physical or virtual. And so every one of those in node majority would get a vote. So if we had five operating systems or servers running, there would be five votes. And again, if you do the math on five, which we just did, we know that the majority is three, which means that two of them could go down and we're still okay, we'd have three running. If we lost one more, we have a problem. Node and disk majority takes it a step further. So it says not only do all of the nodes and servers get a vote, but there's a disk that gets a vote. And this is what we call the witness disk. This is sitting on some type of shared storage, whether that be a SAN, iSCSI, fiber attached, doesn't matter, but it is shared storage that can be seen by all nodes in the cluster. That guy also gets a vote. So if we'd had five nodes and then we added a disk to it, that would actually give us six votes. Node and file share majority is exactly the same as node and disk majority. The only difference here is instead of a disk that has to be seen and viewed and shared among all nodes, it's literally just a file share that can be on any server anywhere in your environment that is accessible by all nodes in the cluster. Where this really comes in handy is if we have a multi-subnet cluster. If we have two nodes in one data center and three nodes in another data center, we can't easily use, unless we're using iSCSI, disk majority is a little hard to use with a shared disk. It's easy to use a file share. The other advantage is, is that we could put it in a third data center, which gives us a different perspective on the network to really validate those network paths to figure out who can actually really be seen if we lose a network in between. So sometimes file share can actually be better than disk majority or having a witness disk, uh, even if you're not going multi-subnet, if you can put it in a different network. And then no majority or disk only, um, so that's two different terms, mean the exact same thing. I like to say disk only because disk only tells me who gets a vote. And it says that only the disk gets a vote. If I have a witness disk and I have five nodes, in node and disk majority, I would have had six total votes, but here I actually only have one. The nodes don't get a vote in disk only, only the disk gets the vote. There's just one single vote. So let's take a little bit closer look at exactly how some of these would work, or how all of them would work. Now node majority here, like we said before, we have five servers here. Physical, virtual, doesn't matter, but every one of them is going to get a vote. So I have five votes here. Again, majority of that doing the math says I have to have three of them up and running. So if I were to have, and we'll do two different scenarios. We'll do a scenario where we have a network outage first and then we lose a couple servers and then we'll reverse it where we lose a couple servers and then we have the network. And I want you to see that because depending upon the order of failures and where the failures may come from can affect how many servers you actually have up and running at any given point in time. And you have to think about these things when you're designing it because you don't always know what's going to go down in what order. So let's say we have a network outage. So this network outage happens in between node 3 and 4, which means that it effectively takes nodes 4 and 5 and they're down 
Now the operating system might be up and running because this is a network outage, right? So the servers didn't go down, but they got cut off the network, which means they can't see the other three nodes. So as far as counting our votes, their votes are no longer available because they've been cut off from the network. So I actually am down to three votes at this point, and I'm okay because three is a majority, so I'm still up and running. I'm perfectly fine in this particular scenario. However, if I lose one more node, doesn't matter which one, I no longer have a majority. Two's not enough. Now the interesting thing to think about with this scenario is I've lost three servers that don't have votes. I'm down. The system's completely down. However, I actually have two servers that are up and running. They're perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with them. I didn't lose screen of death. I didn't lock up. didn't lose a backplane in the hardware. There's absolutely nothing wrong with them. They can still talk to the shared storage. Life's fine with them. However, because they're in a cluster and cannot create a majority vote, it will take the cluster service down and you will not be able to connect. Management doesn't like to see this scenario because they look at this and they go, dude, I paid a lot of money for every single one of those boxes. And you have telling me that you have two of them up and running but we're still down? That doesn't really add up to me. I have two good servers up and running, but I still cannot access my application. So that's a little bit, so keep that in mind because we're going to talk about a way to mitigate that here in a little bit. But that's a tough value proposition to sell to management. So now let's say that we have failures first. So if I have server two and four go down, I'm still okay in this scenario because one, three, and five are up, which still gives me my three votes, so my cluster is still up and running. But if that switch that went crap earlier and died on me, and he craps out again because he's really flaky, and he cuts off servers four and five from the network, now I'm down. Same scenario, still only lost two servers, still had the network outage, but because they worked in reverse and depend upon which ones, notice that we took different servers down this time, and this point I'm actually down because server five has been cut off from the network, which means only node one and node three actually have a vote right now. Two votes is not a majority in this situation. My cluster is going to be down. So that's how node majority works. So let's take a look at node and disk majority. Same concept here, still have to have a majority of votes. The difference is, is that that disk down there that's shared, he now gets a vote. Now you'll notice that the line, it might be a little bit hard to see, but the line pointing to node three is actually yellow. The others are blue, and that's there for a reason. That line indicates that he currently owns the shared disk. Only one server at a time can actually own the resource and access that disk at any given time. Which is funny because we call it shared, but um, it's uh, unlike some of my younger, uh, my youngest daughter, this, this sharing actually is kind, nice sharing. Uh, only one person gets it at a time. Uh, but it's perfectly willing to share it to the other nodes. We just can't share it by accessing it and playing with it at the exact same time. So he owns it currently. So there's actually five no there's five votes here, there's four nodes and one disk. And because the disk also gets a vote, we have a total of five. So the majority here is still three. Now, if my network outage happens first, and that takes out nodes one and two, they cannot see the rest of the network. The nodes three and four are still okay. Now, I have a lot of people look at this and, and they forget that the disk is still down there at the bottom, right? So he's still connected, so he gets a vote. Nodes three and four get a vote, so we actually have three votes here. Well, three is a majority, so we're still up and running. Now, if we lost another node, obviously, we'd be having a little bit of a problem. So let's reverse that again, and let's say that this time we lose our servers first, and it's servers two and three that we lose this time. Now, notice that server three currently owns the disk, but he goes down. So when he goes down, that disk has to move to another node. So I'm going to switch it. Now the first line is yellow. Node one now owns that disk. Great. And we're still up and running because the disk gets a vote. Server one and server five both have a vote. That's three votes. We're still up and running. Now if that flaky switch happens to go down again, 
and we cut off the network and we now lose number five off the network, number uh, node one and the disk is only two votes. That's not a majority. That's not going to get me what I need. My cluster is going to go down in this situation despite the fact that I actually have two operating systems and two servers up and actually physically running. Node and file share majority is the exact same thing. And I'll run through this a little bit much quicker here, but it's the exact same scenario. A little bit of repeat never hurts. The only difference is, is instead of a shared disk, that's literally just a file share. Could be sitting anywhere. Could be sitting on somebody's desktop. Don't do that. Don't put it on a desktop. But if you have a file share server somewhere, maybe you've got another cluster that's hosting file shares, that would be a really ideal place to put it. That way it's also highly available as well. So keep in mind about where you put it. It's always suggested that if you can put it in a different network, that's usually advisable if you're in a multi-subnet situation. So in this situation, same deal, right? Node 3 still owns the share. He's connected to the share, but only one person can actually own it at any given time. If we have a network outage and we lose our two nodes, one and two, we're okay. Three and four are still up and running. They both get a vote. The share's got a vote. That's three votes. That is a majority out of five. If, however, I happen to lose servers two and three, my disk is going to flip. He's going to flip over and be owned by node one now. I'm still okay. Node one and node four have a vote. So does my file share. That gives me three. I have a majority out of my total of five votes. Still good to go. But if that network switch gets a little flaky again and he comes in and cuts node four and five out completely, I no longer have a majority. So you can see how the order of failures can have a majorly adverse effect on whether your Quora model is still up and running. Now, disk only changes the landscape. So if I were to look at this, and I'll give you a second to look at this, how many votes in your mind, I'll give you a second to think of this in your mind, how many votes do you think we have here? So we have five servers and a disk. How many votes, just thinking in your mind, do you see that we have here? Now some of you may have thought, you know what? That's got to be six votes. I got five servers and a disk, that's six votes. But in this quorum model, that's actually not accurate because the disk only means that the disk is the only vote that counts. The nodes do not get votes, only the disk does. Now, the one advantage to this is this. I'm still up and running because I lost only one. I lose a second one, I'm still okay. I lose a third one, I'm okay. I lose a fourth node, I'm actually still up and running. So this puts me in a last man standing only situation. Management likes to see this because they say, hey, I paid a bunch of money in order to be highly available, to be up 99.9999% of the time, and I am because I was able to lose four servers. I'm still up and running, I'm down to a single box. So that situation we talked about earlier where you could actually lose your cluster but still have two, three, four servers up and running, that situation doesn't happen here. On the surface, sounds super cool. Think about it a little bit more though. What happens if I lose that guy? If that disk gets lost or disconnected or corrupted or goes down or something happens to the SAN or it's iSCSI and we have network issues and I lose connection to that, you lose your cluster immediately. Even if all those X's up top were gone and all five servers were running, it doesn't matter. Guess where your databases are sitting? Guess where your witness disk is sitting? Even if your databases were sitting on a different SAN, it wouldn't matter. You lost that witness disk, you're down, and you still would have five servers up and running. That's the flip side of that situation. Generally, don't ever recommend using this model ever, 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 ever. But I do want you to know and be aware of what it is and what it means. So now let's talk about dynamic quorum because the models that we've talked about thus far up to this point have taken into account that they were pre-Windows 2000 and 2012 and 2012 R2. So dynamic quorum was something that was introduced in Windows Server 2012 
And what that says is that the voting, the mathematics behind it, the total pool changes dynamically given upon how many nodes are available at any given point in time. Which means that if I lose a node when I do the math, and remember the math says total number of votes divided by two, add one and round down. However, if I lose a node, that total number of votes, where we started with five earlier dividing by two, that number now changes. It changes to whatever the current maximum number voting is. If you lose a node, it might go down to four. Well, then that means that that number goes to four. The majority of four, that example, right, because four divided by two is two, plus one is three, you round down, the majority out of four is going to be three, which is the same as if you had five nodes if you do the math. You still have to have three, so bad example. But let's say you didn't have three, let's, or let's say you didn't have four, let's say you had three. Well, the majority of three is going to be two. The majority of five was three. So because we're dynamically changing the math here on the total voting pool up top, that means that we can actually stand to lose more because we're dynamically changing what is required to have a majority at any given point in time. Now, in this particular instance, we're going to assume we're running Windows Server 2012 R2. 2012 says that the votes from the nodes are dynamic. 2012R2 says not only are the nodes dynamic, but the disk is dynamic as well. So if you're running 2012, keep that in mind, that disk is not going to be dynamic. In 2012R2, it will be. And I'm also going to show this to you in the demo in a little bit later so you can actually see how this works and where you can see all these numbers at. That way you can assess the current status of your cluster at any given point in time. But right now, if I'm looking at this, I actually have six votes here, which if you think about it is a little weird because if you're familiar with quorum models and the voting mechanism, we generally don't ever want to have an even number of votes. The reason we don't have an even number of votes is we don't want to get caught in what they call a split brain situation where if we had a network failure down the middle, we could actually have enough votes on one side of the network to make quorum and enough votes on the other side to make quorum which means that applications in one data center where those nodes are could actually still talk and make updates and then the other one could talk and make updates and that's a situation we don't ever want to have. So we always want an odd number of votes. So looking at this diagram right out of the gate, that's problematic. We've got six votes and that's not cool. And in Windows Server 2008, this would be a serious problem we would have been definite incorrect architecture. However, this is 2012R2. 2012R2 is smart enough to go, we always need an odd number of votes. That's not going to work. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, you know what? The disk, he doesn't get a vote anymore. I'm just going to go ahead and take it away. He's still up and running and still legitimately there, but I'm just going to say that you don't count for right now. You're going to sit on the sidelines uh, and you're just going to wait until I need you. So that would say that we only have five votes at this particular point in time. And you'll notice that the disk is actually owned by three, node number three. So let's play with the, the server outage scenario here. So let's say I lose server number two. Now what's going to happen here is that right now we said that it took the vote away from the disk. So if the disk doesn't have a vote right now, and the node 2 doesn't have a vote right now. How many, no, how many votes do we have here then? So that would mean that 1, 3, 4, and 5 all have votes. So that gives me 4 votes. However, when a server 2012R2 is going to look at that and go, wait a minute, I can't have 4 votes. That's an even number. So what it's going to do to maintain that odd number is it's going to give the vote back to the disk. So in this scenario, we actually have five votes. So we actually lost a server and our votes never changed, interestingly enough. What happens if we lose another one? Well, he's going to look at us and go, well, I have four votes. Because remember at this point, the disk has a vote and then those three nodes have a vote. That gives me four and it looks at it and goes, well, that's not cool. I can't have an even number of votes. 
I need to make that odd. So I'm going to go to the disk and I'm going to take his vote away. And he's going to sit there on the sidelines a little bit longer. And then we have three nodes. And it's still quorum because remember, even though we would have normally had that three up and running, here we actually don't. The math is changing. So he takes the, note, the vote away from the disk. Those three guys have votes now. But what's the majority of three? It's two now. So now I actually only have to have two up and running. All right, let's take it a step further. Let's say we lose this node here, node number four. Now, the cluster's going to look at it and go, oh, wait a minute, I got two here. That's not cool, so let me give the vote back to the disk. The disk gets his vote back, which puts us back at three. Majority of that is still two, so I'm still okay. I still have a majority of votes here. What happens if I lose another one? I lose server three. He currently owns the disk. You can see the yellow line there, so he owns it. So the first thing we got to do is it's going to switch over to the only remaining node at this point, and he's now going to own the disk. And the cluster is going to look at this and go, hmm, I only have two left at this point. Um, I'm going to take the vote away from the disk, so there's only one vote, but I'm still up and running. So what happens with this scenario is, if you think about the end diagram that we're looking at right now, this looks a lot like the node disk majority, doesn't it? So what's really, really cool about this is I can get all the way down to a last man standing situation without the risk of just having the disk go down. Because remember, with no disk, or with disk only, the disk was the only guy that got a vote. And if he went down, we were totally up the creek without a paddle. But here, we can still get to that really cool last man standing situation, which management loves to see because they paid all the money for all those nodes and servers, and we can actually don't go down until we lose our very last server or the storage. Obviously, if we lost the storage, we'd be down anyway. But we'd still be good to go. We'd still be up and running in this situation. So again, dynamic quorum came out in Windows Server 2012. Adding the disk to be dynamic was 2012 R2. If there is absolutely no other reason to go to Windows Server 2012 and 2012 R2, this is it. Because when it comes to high availability and you start looking at like, am I going to get two nines, three nines, four nines, five nines? Now all of a sudden your availability has gone up because you can be up and you have a higher tolerance for being able to lose more servers and more votes. All right, so moving on from Quorum, we'll talk about the MSDTC here. Just want you to know that starting in SQL Server 20 or starting in SQL Server 2008, the MSDTC was actually not required anymore. Um, even though it's not required um, to have to have that in a cluster, and it was even if you weren't using it, it was required. But now, starting uh, in SQL Server 2008 and up, you don't need it if you're not using it. If you are not sure, because I've had several clients that aren't really sure whether they're using it or not, and you say, well, you know what, um, our old cluster, we're migrating from, had it, but that was because it was required to be there, but we're not really sure if we're actually using it or not. The good news about the MSDTC is this is the one thing about a cluster that if you don't set it up right out of the gate, it's actually fairly easy to add after the fact so long as it doesn't take you a super long time to get a new LUN provision, so that you have a disk for it and a new IP with a DNS name. So long as you can provision those in a fairly decent amount of time, and again, if you were migrating, we would normally always make sure that we put our test load on there and we tested everything out before we went production with it anyway, so we would know this ahead of time, but this is actually a fairly easy thing to add after the fact. For your storage configuration, one of the things they added in the operating system, uh, Microsoft added MPIO, so it's multi-pathing IO. Typically, if you were going to use MPIO, uh, depending upon which vendor you were using, you would use the piece of software that they gave you to manage your MPIO. The negative to that was is if you were using, let's pick Hitachi, for example, there in the middle. If you picked Hitachi and you were running their software uh, in order to attach to their SAN, what if they needed, what if they updated it and they had some type of uh, issue or enhancement to it and they put out an update to their software? Are you constantly checking to make sure that it got updated? 
because if you're not, then you wouldn't know anything about it and you wouldn't be running the current version. So the nice thing about this is what Microsoft has done is they've essentially created a wrapper. And so NetApp, Hitachi, EMC, all these guys, the three that I've listed here, that's because, um, and I can add Commvault to that, but um, those are three that I specifically know for sure because I've used them, are supported through MPIO. That is not it. There's a lot more vendors that are supported through MPIO. Um, I just happen to know for sure that those definitely do. But the advantage here is, is that because Microsoft, you're using their version of it, if Hitachi and EMC make an update to it, they send it to Microsoft, Microsoft puts the update in their version of MPIO, and then you can get that down through Windows Update so you can remain updated all the time. If you're using iSCSI and you're connecting to iSCSI, you need to use dedicated NICs for that, and you cannot team them. So if you have two NICs running to your iSCSI storage, you cannot team those inside the cluster. Uh, but again, please use dedicated NICs. Um, we talked about that in part one, that one of the best things that you can do when you're creating your cluster as far as uh, you know performance tuning and, and that kind of stuff is making sure that you separate every piece of traffic so that you get a greater overall throughput. Uh, disk configuration, as you're configuring these disks, you're going to need those to be NTFS because we're going to put SQL Server on them. You're going to want to make sure that you format those with a 64K allocation unit size and make sure that disk sector alignment is taken care of. That is handled automatically from Server 2008 and up, so you don't actually have to worry about that these days. So there are a few different storage needs. At, these are the things that you're going to need as you plan out your storage. Again, prepare, prepare, prepare. Make sure you have everything you need before you begin. If you're going to need a witness disk, make sure you plan to have a one and store a piece of storage for that. Make sure you have one for MSDTC if you're going to use an MSDTC. Uh, system databases for your data files and log files. Same for user data in log files. You're going to need some space for tempdb to put that somewhere. The one that I find people forget about most is dependent upon how you're doing your backups. Make sure you've got space to go put your backup somewhere. I realize that you just put this in this super cool, awesome cluster with dynamic quorum and you think it is never going to go down. So you don't really need backups because you have multiple copies of it and all this other kind of cool stuff. Please make sure you have backups. Step one of any HA or DR plans to make sure that you have backups. No matter how many other copies of your database you have out there, you need to be sure that you have backups. So plan for some extra storage space for that. Uh, software configuration, you need to make sure that every node's identical. And what we mean here is that the operating system has to be identical. You cannot have a Windows 2012 node and a Windows Server 2008 node. They need to be running the same service pack and they need to have the hot fixes. When we talk about cluster validation here in a second, that is something that cluster validation looks at to make sure that you have. Uh, AV software, if you're going to put a, uh, antivirus software on your server, make sure that you do your normal excludes. Microsoft's got a great KV article on this, so the things that you need to make sure you're excluding from your scans. Uh, but in general, if you're looking at any of your data files, log files, backup files, or transaction log files, we want to make sure that we have exclusions in for those. And because we're on a cluster, we're also going to want to exempt both the witness disk and the MSDTC disk from that as well. Planning for firewall and ports. I'm just going to pop these up here so that you can look at these. You guys will be able to download the slide deck. I'll provide that. Um, actually, I think the slide deck might be available on my blog, ryanjadams.com. If you click presentations up at the top, I'm pretty sure it's actually already out there. You can download it from there. Um, that way you have this for reference and don't have to memorize this. But if you're in an environment that you've got a strict firewall, these are the ports that you're going to need. First one's going to be for your clustering service, and that's a service that runs on every one of these operating systems that actually handles the cluster service itself and keeps everything talking, handles quorum and voting and all that kind of good stuff. Cluster administrator is the GUI piece that we actually open up to administer and take a look at our cluster, which we'll actually be looking at here in just a minute. RPC, uh, RPC is required for cluster and MSDTC. Security guys usually aren't really thrilled about opening 135 ever since the slammer days. However, it is going to be required. 
and of course SQL Server, right? So if you're running a default instance, 14.33 of course. If you're running a named instance, then what you're going to need to do if you're running a firewall is you're going to need to go in and make that port static as opposed to being dynamic. Um, that way you can open that up in the firewall. Um, if you are going to be dynamic, you're going to want a 14.34 UDP open for the SQL browser service. That way you can utilize the browser service when specifying the instance name to figure out exactly what port it is running on. Again, in a firewall situation, in order to do something like that, you really need to make that port static. Otherwise, you're just going to have to open up a giant range of ports, which is kind of defeats the purpose. So cluster validation, we talked about in part one, if you remember, that what cluster validation does is it means that I don't really necessarily need to have identical hardware anymore. That used to be a requirement on the HCL list. It used to much have that hardware compatibility list that was required us to have all the, all the hardware to be consistent. Now, although that's still recommended that you do that, it's not actually required that you do that anymore. You can hand have different pieces of hardware uh, if that is what you need or to do. Again, just want to reiterate, not exactly something that we uh, would recommend that you do, uh, but it can be done. And that's what cluster validation does, is it helps look at all the different things that we're looking at. So the first thing it looks at is an inventory, and it's just taking a look at all the different things that you've got. So it's looking at the hardware, it's looking at the BIOS, looking at how much memory is on each node, whether the software is updated, it's taking a look at drivers to make sure there's not any uh, unsigned drivers or things like that. It's going to take a look at the network and what it's looking for there is a few different things. It wants to make sure that um, any network that it sees on the individual nodes, as long as it can be accessed by all the nodes, it's going to bring that into the cluster and make that available inside the cluster. So if you have iSCSI storage, so you have NIC cards that are attached, then it's going to see that and want to bring that into the cluster. You're going to want to go disable that in the cluster after the fact because you don't want the cluster to utilize that. That's only for your iSCSI storage. But if it sees it available, it's going to do that. And it wants to verify what networks can be seen from each individual node. It also looks at the network binding order as well. Uh, in a cluster, we need to make sure that whatever is going to be the public side, which we talked about that in part one, that is bound first in the network binding order. Uh, if, by the way, you do the network binding order and you do put it in there first and validation still gives you an error, that is because the cluster has a internal hidden uh, kind of NIC card and there's also a lot of those tunneling adapters and stuff that you'll see. You know, if you go look at your uh, NICs in the GUI, you'll see maybe three or four, but if you go do an IP configs from a command prompt, you'll see a bunch of extra ones in there you didn't realize existed, and they're just hidden from you in the GUI, but they actually exist in the registry. And if any one of those is bound prior to the public, you're still going to get that error. I've actually written a blog post on how to fix that, so if you run into that situation, make sure you go hit my blog, um, and it'll walk you through how to resolve that issue. Uh, storage takes a look at, hey, what disks are available, and can I see them, and can I fail them over from one node to another? Uh, and system configuration looks at things like Active Directory. Uh, when we create a cluster, it does create a CNO or a cluster name object to represent the cluster. It's a computer object, but it's an Active Directory, and it needs to make sure that the account you're using has the rights to be able to create that in Active Directory. Um, there are ways around that. You can pre-stage that um, if you do not have the rights, uh, but that is something that is going to be required there. And this is also where it looks for service pack levels, operating system edition, different versions, and all that kind of stuff to make sure everything matches up. Uh, just a few common validation errors. These are the ones that I just see that are the absolute most common that you'll run across. Software updates missing, looking for different patches, KVs, all that kind of stuff. It wants to do that. The great thing is, is when it does, it'll come back and say, uh, KV 1, 2, and 9 were missing. And I'm just making up those numbers, not legitimate numbers, right? They're missing off node 1, but node 4 is missing 12, 14, and 45, and node 6 is missing 72, 140, and 19. So it'll tell you in the report exactly which nodes are missing what and the KB article name so that you can go pull that down and make sure they're updated. So it's a really easy thing to solve if you get those warnings. Unsigned drivers. 
you'll want to update those. Um, if you have any unsigned drivers, it will report those and what they are and on what nodes. Um, I had a client uh, just this last weekend I was working on. Uh, they had the right proper driver on all of their nodes except for one that was unsigned, even though they were identical hardware and it was for a NIC card. Somehow they managed to get an older unsigned driver on there, so we had to make sure we got that updated. Uh, rights in Active Directory, which is I just described that to you there a second ago. Uh, if you're using an availability group that you're going to put on this, availability groups don't use shared storage. So the cluster itself on the Windows side, it has no idea what you're planning on putting on top of this cluster. You could be putting an FCI on it, failover cluster instance of SQL Server, you could be putting an availability group on it, you could be running file share on top of it, you could be running Hyper-V on top of it, it has no idea what you're doing. But because that is the norm and typical way to have shared storage, it will report that it doesn't actually see any shared storage and throw a warning at you. Again, still supported with warnings, perfectly mobile to have that in an availability group situation, so you can safely ignore that. Network binding order, we just talked about that, it does check for that as well. So those are the most common issues and errors that I see. So a few post-installation steps. These are the things that I always encourage everybody to do after you've created your cluster. Go rename your networks. That way they make sense and you know what they do. It'll really pay dividends when you have issues and you need to troubleshoot it later on down the road. Verify the quorum configuration. And I'm going to show you an example of that. So in part one, we actually built a five node cluster uh, and node five is actually in a different subnet. So it's a five node multi subnet cluster that we built in part one uh, a couple weeks ago. And so we're going to go take a look at the quorum configuration here in a minute of what it decided to do for Quorum and why we need to verify that. We want to perform a failover. I see this time and time again. When you've completed your cluster, you need to fail over the cluster resources to every single node to make sure that they're running and successful on every node. I see so many people that forget to do that. That also applies after you install a SQL Server. If you install an availability group, a failover cluster instance, when you're done, you absolutely need to fail it over to every single node to ensure that it doesn't work. I have seen folks that have done that. They did, forgot to do that. They went production with it. They didn't have a failure for six months, thank goodness, but when it failed over and node one went down in a two-node cluster, well, guess what? They had some type of error. They were not able to reach storage. They had a security issue. They didn't have the rights configured properly. And next thing you know, they're down. So make sure you verify that. Um, install any service packs or needed hot fixes as they come out. Make sure you're checking and doing that on a constant basis. Remember, we talked about cluster aware updating last time. Uh, make sure that if you're in the cluster, if you're running Windows 2012, you should absolutely be taking advantage of that feature. Um, if you're running multiple instances or multiple types of things of different roles inside of this and you want some roles to run on one node and some roles to run on another even during the failover, uh, if you want to set preferred nodes, now would be the time to go ahead and do that uh, as soon as you're done and get everything installed and make sure that works the way that you expect. If you're doing that, what I see a lot of folks do is they go, oh, well, I've got two nodes, I've got three roles. Two instances of SQL Server are going to run on node one, and the third one's going to run on node two, and then they'll be happy and they have the resources to run. What they didn't think about is, is when node two fails over and now all of a sudden he's running all three nodes, is it configured and can that single node handle the entire load of all three instances? I have seen it time and time again where folks forget to take that into consideration and that server starts to have severe issues because it was not designed and does not have the specs, the CPU, the RAM and those types of things and the instances are not configured properly to take into consideration that particular situation. If you're wanting to use Kerberos, which I highly suggest that you do, uh, you will need to configure your service principal names for that as well. So let's walk into a little bit of a demo here and let's just take a look at a few of these things just to see what exactly they happen to look like. So I want to switch over to my VM here and remember that we built out our cluster last time and uh, let me go full screen here. 
log in. And when we built this guy out, so we're going to go into Server Manager here. This guy pops up in Windows 2012. He's actually useful now compared to Windows 2008. Um, one of the main useful things is the fact that I can click tools right here at the beginning and pretty much every tool that I need or any particular uh, role or feature that I add is going to show up here. And of course, here's our failover cluster manager. So let's open that and take a look at our cluster. And I'm going to have to speed through this a little bit because I realize that <clears throat> we are running out of time here. I'm not, but you guys might be, I'm sure. So here's our cluster. Taking a quick look at this guy, here's our nodes. And as you can see, we do indeed have five nodes running. You'll also notice that these columns, we have an assigned vote column and a current vote column. Assigned vote is an advanced configuration option where in certain situations we could actually go in and manually remove a vote of quorum from a particular node if we wanted to. The current vote, however, that's the dynamic quorum piece. And so if we were to have a failure of a node, when dynamic quorum adjusted itself, we would actually see the votes change right here in this column. So that's kind of a cool thing to be able to see, and that's where you will find that. So the first thing I want to do is, normally we'd want to rename our networks. Now, I told you in part one, before we ever created our cluster here, that the smartest thing we could have done was to actually label our NIC cards. And that's exactly what I've done here. I have two NIC cards on every single one of my five nodes. One that is configured for a private network, which is the heartbeat. We wanted that segregated traffic of its own and one for the public. And I've got that labeled properly. That way it removes any ambiguity and is very clear to anybody else that looks at this cluster if they weren't the one that set it up or if it's been six months to a year since I've had to troubleshoot and look into this and know what's what. But where this manifests itself, and of course this is a, a very contrived particular uh, type situation since obviously I've only got the two, but if we look in the cluster and I go to my network nodes over here on the left, let me sort them real quick, when I look at this, how useful is it for me to see cluster network one, two, three, and four? Oops, I want to draw. That's not useful for me at all. That's meaningless to me. I don't know what's in there. I don't have a clue or what it's supposed to do. Because what I do know is that this column tells me what those networks are allowed to do. And I don't want them all to look like that. Because remember, we have a private network. He should only allow cluster traffic. You shouldn't allow client traffic, right? So if what I want to do is look at this, and if I were to, so I've clicked network one, I'm going to come down here to the bottom, and I'm going to click the tab. This is one thing I don't like about 2012, is they kind of hit all the details on this network connections tab down here at the bottom that you can barely see that they've hidden. So if I click that, I can actually see the resources that are in here. Now, had I not labeled all of mine, I would have seen funny names in here like Intel Pro 1000 Wireless blah, 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 NT2499. Oh, that's what I would have seen in here. But it's very clear to me that these were all designed to be on the private network. And this is my private network. And I can see that I have nodes 1, 2, 3, and 4 in here. Now, you don't see node 5 in here because, remember, he's on a different subnet. That is a different network, and we will find that network in here. So the smartest thing you could do would be to go in here and say, you know what, if this is private, I need to do two things. One, I need to relabel him. So I'm going to call this uh, private network one. We will have two private networks because, remember, there's a multi-subnet. So node five, because he has his own subnet for private and public, he's actually going to have a private network too. So let me go ahead and at least label it properly. That's great. However, it also is allowing cluster and client traffic. And that's the default. But because this is private, I don't want it to own that. I don't want client traffic. So I'm going to uncheck this checkbox right here. When I do that, and I click Apply, and I click OK, and that warning box just says, hey, by the way, you're telling me that this is only private traffic. And then we notice that this column 
at the top has now changed and it says cluster only. And I'd want to go through here and I'd want to do that for every network, right? Here's cluster network two. Guess what? Pretty clear to me, this is a public network. Public network one because he's got nodes one, two, three, and four. Which means that these guys must be for node five because he's on his own network and sure enough, look, there's the private. This one's got to be a public then, right? For just node five. So I want to enable you know, public network two and private network two. So then when you come back in here and you see these all labeled correctly, it's very clear what type of traffic is allowed on what network and what NIC cards on what servers are in that network. It makes troubleshooting so much easier that you will thank yourself in the long run, six months down the road when you have to troubleshoot something, that you took the time to do that now. So since we are running really, really short on time, I would have loved to have gone super, super long for another half an hour here and shown you more. But the most important thing I really wanted to show you though, is I wanted to show you how dynamic quorum works. Because we saw how valuable that is to be able to take advantage of that. And I've already kind of shown you, just by looking at my nodes over here and looking at my columns, I can see who does and doesn't have a vote. Now, my quorum model here, what does this guy tell me that I'm running? He tells me that the model that I'm running is that I have a witness desk. So I must be running, that is supposed to be a box. I should be running node and disk majority, right? Because I've got a witness disk here and I've got my nodes. So how am I supposed to figure out whether this witness disk has a vote? And this is the one thing I really wish they would have added is you can see all the cluster resources right here. If I scroll down to the bottom, there's this cluster core resources section. Let me expand these and zoom in so we can actually see them. Let's see if I can drag that up. Actually, I can't. I can see that I have a disk in here, and I can see that I've got some names and IPs in here. However, what it doesn't tell me about this disk, actually, let me roll, move up to the disk. There is no column here. There's a status and information column. That's it. That's all that's there. It doesn't tell me whether it has a vote right now or not. I have no idea if this has a vote. The only way to figure out whether that disk currently has a vote, because if you think about it, I got five nodes and a disk, that's six. So theoretically, he shouldn't have a vote right now. We've actually got to go to PowerShell. I'll provide all these scripts later, so you don't really have to worry about the code here. But I'm going to run this. What this is going to tell me is whether he has a vote right now or not. Let me zoom in so we can actually see this guy. So down here at the bottom, when I run this, this is the piece that I want to look at right here. There's the name of my cluster. It tells me that dynamic quorum is enabled, and this tells me that the witness dynamic weight is zero, which means that he currently does not have a vote. And he shouldn't, because then we'd have an even number of voters, and we don't want that. We need that to be odd. So we wouldn't want that. Now what happens if, to see dynamic quorum and exactly how it works, what if, let me switch VMs here for a second, what if I were to go over to node number four, login, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in and I'm going to shut down the cluster service to replicate that this, or uh, as if this guy had actually gone down. So I'll go down here to services under my tasks, and then I'm just going to go in as soon as it pulls up here in a second. I'm going to find the cluster service. Here he is right here. And I'm just going to say I'm just going to go ahead and stop him. And then I'm going to go back over here to our first node. If I run this again and zoom in, now we can see he has a vote. One means that the disk now has a vote. And if I go back into the cluster manager, it's super cool here on nodes. Not only is he down, but I can see that his vote has been removed. So when if I'm calculating that total pool, I can see that I have one vote, two votes, three votes, four votes, 
And of course, I need to take into consideration, go look at my disk, which we just did, he would actually have five votes, which means the majority would need to be three. And again, we could step this down just like we did when we went through the slide deck, and we could watch them as each one of these goes down. If I bring this guy back online and start the cluster service back up again, we'll see the exact opposite behavior. It should reverse itself. And it happened just that fast. The current vote for that guy, the node came online, his vote is back. If I go look at it in PowerShell, run this code, line of code again, zoom in, sure enough I can see this guy changed. He's now back to zero again. So he doesn't have a vote. So you can see how this dynamic quorum works. And that's how we're going to have to take a look at that. Unfortunately, we do have to jump out to PowerShell to actually run some commands to be able to see that. It would have been nice to be able to see that in the GUI. Uh, hopefully Microsoft will add that sometime in the future. It would have been nice to be able to see that right here out of the gate uh, without having to look at it. The good news is you can also see the vote. You don't have to look in both places. There is another line here, and again, I'll provide the code that I can run, and it will actually show you, um, if I zoom in down here, this is exactly what we just looked at in the GUI. Terminology is slightly different, but this dynamic weight and node weight, those are the columns that we just looked at. So we know exactly what we're looking at here. So we can see all of it in PowerShell in one place if we need to look at it that way. So again, there's a lot of cool things. Don't forget about cluster aware updating. Um, there's a lot of things that we can do in here in regards to uh, server manager. We can do custom searches. We can do node draining and a lot of other cool stuff. Um, unfortunately, we didn't have quite enough time to get to those, and I apologize for that. Um, but with that, um, I'm going to wrap up uh, just a little summary here of the things that we talked about. We talked about quorum and storage and cluster validation. I hope you guys enjoyed this and got a lot out of this. Um, I'm, I'm going to take a few questions here uh, for just a couple more minutes. Um, and uh, But any questions I don't have time to get to, I'm going to have Julie just email those over to me. So go ahead and put those in the chat box. And what I'll do is I'll write a blog post and I'll answer all those questions for you in a blog post. And then we'll announce that out. Uh, that way you guys can see all of that and make sure that we get all your questions answered. So Julie, if you've got a couple of questions, I can take a couple minutes um, and uh, answer just a couple of questions. There actually are no questions in the list. Whoops, here we go. Is the video going to be available later online? Yes. Uh, this uh, is being recorded and it will be on the archive page of the DBA Virtual Chapter website. Well, I guess that means I must have done an amazing job if there's no questions because everybody thoroughly understands everything, right? Yes, yes. I'm going to work well, on that I, assumption. I have a much better understanding of Quorum. Here we go. Is there any best practices for service accounts running the cluster services or just local system? Uh, usually for the cluster service itself, uh, the default local system is perfectly fine. Uh, there's, there's no major issue with doing that. If you're talking about SQL Server, however, uh, SQL Server Service, SQL Server Agent, those guys, that's a different story. You do want to use a domain service account for those. Uh, the best practice here is if you have multiple instances, and this applies anywhere by the way, even if you have 12 standalone SQL servers, don't use the same service account for all 12 of those servers because guess what happens if somebody locks it out or disables it or deletes it on accident? You just lost all 12 of your servers. Same with clustering. If you have multiple instances in a cluster, if that service goes down and gets locked out, you lost them all. If they all have their own, then you've greatly reduced your risk factor because you only lose that one instead of a bunch. And it's... Uh Jason had another follow-up question, the shared disk versus shared file. Can you elaborate on best practice? Uh, repeat that again. Shared disk versus a shared file. I, I think that was, um, you know, when you can have the file system versus the disk. Um, so... The only choices that you have is to either use the disk witness, which is the shared disk, which essentially puts it on the file system, um, as opposed to what I assume, I think what you really mean in file, instead of file system is file share. Yeah. 
Um, so with a file share, the only difference with a file share is just location. If you're in a multi-subnet cluster, you really need to have a file share. It's the only way to do it, um, unless you're going to do SAN replication or something like that. But you've really got to do that. Um, the reason because you can't talk to that. There are mul multiple different physical locations and, and different subnets. You've got to have a file share sitting out there that both subnets can talk to. You can't really do that with a shared disk. So that's really where you want to use a shared disk is in a multi-subnet cluster. Okay. okay. Any thoughts on using managed manage server accounts instead of standard domain accounts for SQL server services? So that actually I just kind of answered as part of the other question. Yeah. Ta -da, any best friend? That's it. <laughs> That's okay. it for questions. <clears throat> but I'll uh, I'll also send these to you. Uh, once again, I really wanted to thank you for an excellent presentation on getting everybody uh, started with the uh, clustering. So we're looking forward to the future presentations on high yeah, avail definitely. on high availability. So thank you, Ryan. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. And like I mentioned, this is uh, recorded and will be posted to our archive site. Thank you. Thank you.